Dr. Paris B. Patel is a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist who obtained his dental degree from Howard University College of Dentistry in 2011. Dr. Patel went on to practice general dentistry for a couple of years in the Lubbock area, working on a mobile dental unit with a federally qualified health center. In 2014, he began his residency in oral, oral, oral and maxillofacial pathology at TMU College of Dentistry. Upon completion of his residency, Dr. Patel took a position at the College of Dentistry and is currently a full-time faculty member in the Department of Diagnostic Sciences. He maintains a clinical practice actively seeing patients who suffer from various oral diseases in the Stomatology Center in the College of Dentistry and is an active surgical pathologist in a busy biopsy service. Dr. Patel's previous work experience and curiosity have shaped his approach to diagnosis and management of disease. It is with extreme pleasure and that I turn the controls over now to Dr. Patel. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, it's really, really good to be here and uh, have an opportunity to speak um, uh, in this sort of setting for the Texas Oral Health Coalition. We do have a lot to get through, so I'm going to apologize uh, in advance if I do run over a little bit, but this is a topic that is pretty heavy and I think it does require uh, a little bit of time and, and care in regards to what we're going to discuss. So um, again, thank you uh, to the Texas Oral Health Coalition, uh, Beth, Rhonda, uh, everybody that has kind of put this together and allowed for this sort of opportunity um, uh, during, this, during this time. All right, uh, this is my contact information and I'll put it up again at the end of the lecture. Uh, my office number here, um, I give my cell phone out uh, because it's easy to get a hold of me and I am working like many of you all the time. So if you ever need anything, if you ever have, have a if you ever have questions um, regarding uh, not just the topics that we're going to discuss today, but anything that an oral pathologist may be able to help you in, uh, I'm here. Um, and so is the rest of the team here. So, and my email address, of course. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, we're going to start with a little bit of an overview of what cancer means, um, and then go into some of, some of the statistics um, uh, that are present now for cancer diagnoses in the United States. Um, and then we'll move on to kind of a simplified version of carcinogenesis, how cancer develops. And that can get quite complex, so I'm going to keep it pretty much uh, simple and, and easy to understand for not just your purpose, but also for me, because some of this stuff is over my head also. Um, and then we'll have an overview of what oral cancer is, which many of you should be aware is now broken down into a few specific sites, such as the oral pharynx, which is very different from the disease we encounter in the oral cavity, and the lip, which is more like your typical skin cancers as opposed to the cancers that we get properly uh, within the oral cavity, such as a tongue cancer. Um, we'll talk about some of the risk factors, the ones that we all know about, um, some that we may not know about, and then we'll move on to a lot of clinical cases in regards to the premalignant lesions, um, as well as cases of uh, patients presenting with cancer, not just to my practice here, but to colleagues across the state. So cancer is a pretty heavy topic, um, and many of us will likely be affected by this term that carries a lot of weight throughout our life, whether it be personally um, or through a close contact. It is something that is almost imminent, unfortunately, in, in many cases. Understanding from a healthcare or health provider's perspective that this is not just a medical term, it carries with it a lot of socioeconomic implications that are often over, overlooked, uh, as well as implications in regards to quality of life. We always talk about the curing of cancer. We don't often discuss as much as we should about how the quality of life of these individuals is going to be affected for the remainder years that they do have, or the impact that it takes not just on them, but their support group, their society. Um, so this is a community-based disease process, and um, understanding that can go a long way in regards to building patient rapport and, and giving back to the community itself. 
So cancer was originally, it, it fr- comes from the Greek word that means crab. And there's some speculation whether it was a cut tumor uh, that they looked at and it looked like it was infiltrating like the appendages of a crab throughout the normal tissue, or whether it was some of the blood vessels leading up to the tumor that looked like appendages of a crab. And that's kind of where the term was derived. Um, Today, it's used to describe any malignant proliferation of a group of cells. Um, And those could be epithelial, like the majority of things we're going to discuss today, um, which are squamous cell carcinoma, which arises from the epithelial lining within the oral cavity, uh, and accounts for greater than 90% of the cancers we see in the oral cavity, or it could be any other cell type as well. So this is probably the best example I could find that looks actually like a crab. This is a breast cancer, and this is the normal adipose or fatty tissue of the breast. And you can see this white here is a cancerous growth, and it's extending and infiltrating or invading into the surrounding normal tissues, and it looks kind of like a crab. So the statistics, um, I've never been a huge numbers guy, uh, believe it or not, but this is something that really... Um, is impactful when it comes to understanding what we need to be doing on a regular basis. And I'm going to kind of come full circle to that point as we discuss uh, the number of cancer diagnoses and cancer deaths uh, in the population. So we look at cancer numbers and they're pretty much predicted and projected every year by the American Cancer Society uh, with the help of uh, SEER data. And this year, there's projected to be, by the end of the year, 1.89 million new cancer diagnoses in the United States, okay? This is cancer as a whole. This is not oral cancer alone. Um, and that's 1.89 million new diagnoses of cancer this year. If you break it, out, break it down to kind of our state, uh, last year we were projected to have 129. And again, this is through a statistical analysis where they take into account the years before um, and, and extrapolate and predict future values. And then in 2021, we're expected to have 133,000 cases by the end of the year, okay? Who are the individuals that are typically afflicted by cancer? Well, 80% of these folks are gonna be in the middle sixth decade or seventh decade, so a little bit older, all right? Um, 55 and up. Males and females have a roughly equal distribution in regards to new cancer cases and cancer deaths. Um, however, if you break down specific cancers, there, there is, does have a tendency to be a little bit more of a male predilection or predominance in some of these cases. So new cancer cases um, and deaths for 2021, if you look at the top three, that has remained roughly the same for decades, and that is prostate for males, breast for females, lung and bronchus, and then colorectal. However, in the past few decades, we've started to notice an increase in the number of oral cavity and pharyngeal cancers. Now, they lump these together, and that directly correlates actually to the increase in oral pharyngeal cancers over the past few decades, um, as opposed to oral cavity proper cancers. Um, In regards to estimated deaths, we still are not in the top 10 positive um, cancer deaths. Uh, Lung and bronchus still remains the top one, followed by breast and prostate and females and males and colorectal, as well as other uh, types of cancers that uh, people will die from this year. So looking at oral and oral pharyngeal cancer in 2021, we're looking at roughly 54,000 cases, uh, new cases that is, uh, being diagnosed within the year. When we break it down just to oral cancer, it's a, a little over 35,000 cases, and the estimated deaths are close to 7,000 deaths in oral cancer and close to 4,000 deaths in pharyngeal cancer, okay? Uh, And these are very different diseases, and I'm going to kind of explain that as we go through the course of our lecture, right? Looking at the incidence, uh, there's been an increase in whites annually over the past few decades in oral pharyngeal cancers, and this is directly associated with those that are driven by HPV, okay? And this is the first time I'm mentioning that word, human papillomavirus, but this is a distinct disease process that has a stronghold in the oral pharynx, okay? Less than 4% of oral cavity proper cancers are actually HPV driven, and they don't behave the same way they do in the oral pharynx, okay? The oral pharynx is a distinct disease whenever it's HPV driven that has a remarkable prognosis compared to ones that are not HPV driven, and again, limited to uh, the oral pharynx by and large. Mortality trends, this has been uh, 
concerning, but we've seen an almost 1% increase per year um, over the past two decades in mortality after a, a, a decline, a steady decline um, in oral and pharyngeal cancer. Um, and then cancer in young individuals, in individuals less than 40. Surprisingly, we're seeing an increased number of these types of cancers as well. And it's this population that oftentimes comes into our practices uh, that does not have that classic history of smoking and drinking, things that we would attribute as being risk factors for the development of oral cancer. So thanks to the Census Bureau, you know, we have our lovely bimodal kind of graph or distribution of the population in 2016. And as you see over the course of the next couple of decades, what we can expect to see in our population, okay? And the thing I wanna focus on here is that it seems that there's gonna be an increase in the aged population. I will say I'm not taking into account pandemic babies. So there's a, there's a possibility for a little shift here. Um, but uh, overall, it seems that there is going to be an increase in the aged population, right? What does that mean for us? Well, you go back and you think about those individuals who are being diagnosed with cancer being in the older age group, okay? Um, and so this is something that may become more prevalent in your practice or patients may present with undiagnosed disease in your practice. And it's good to be aware of these things, right? This is where it makes an impact on your day-to-day -day life. We can't ignore the changing environment, especially in current times, uh, which is really amplified by the current venue of us doing this virtually. But uh, the pandemic has had multiple effects. And American Cancer Society got along with the CDC and they came up with this graph um, of possible outcomes as a result of the pandemic. And you talk about reduced access to care. Uh, one, uh, all of us probably have patients that are fearful of being out in public, rightly so. Um, reallocation of healthcare resources to uh, help back the pandemic efforts at this point. Unemployment. A drastic increase in unemployment unemployment rates, a loss of insurance, a loss of income. This does not only affect the individual, but it could affect their dependents, their family, um, and, and those that they're in charge uh, of caring for. Um, shutdowns and social distancing. This can affect uh, appointments again, and a lot of other things here that, that come into play that make this a really complex situation. Also, this leads down the path to prevention, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment. So what does this mean when we take all of this stuff together? Um, we can't overlook the fact that there's additional considerations that have been inherent in our populations. And, and that is the socioeconomic disparities and racial disparities that exist. To date, even though there's an increase in the incidence of white or Caucasian males getting oral pharyngeal cancer, to date, the blacks are diagnosed at a more advanced stage of disease. Non-whites typically have a poorer prognosis than do whites. So these disparities do exist, right? So taking all the information that, that I've kind of presented so far, we have an increase in the aging population, right? We have alterations in diagnosis and care and management as a result of the pandemic, right? Um, and now you have this further divide that ends up happening as a result of what's happened over the last year and a half or two years in socioeconomic and existing racial disparities. That means that we may be in the position to see increased numbers of cases of oral premalignant lesions and cancers in our practices, especially those of us that are in public health or those of you that are in public health. Um, you're probably well aware in my short stint in public health, we saw many a patient with undiagnosed systemic diseases. So not only are they barely seeing an oral healthcare provider for the first time, this may be the only healthcare provider that they've seen. So again, this has a trickle down effect. And as I tell my students and residents, we are not only responsible for the oral cavity, we are responsible for the individual as a whole. We manage those diseases in the oral cavity, but uh, you have to take into account all of these things when you're evaluating your patients. Uh, and this is where the, st the statistics really do uh, have a large impact. Okay, so carcinogenesis. Uh, and again, this is more of a simplified version of the development of cancer. Um, as with most things these days, cancer is thought to be multifactorial. It's not just a single thing. I think all of you are probably aware of that one story or some a family relative or a friend whose grandfather smoked his whole life, never developed any cancer and died at the age of 110. Um, clearly, he was, a, you know, exposed to carcinogens, 
but that's not enough, okay? There's usually some underlying genetic susceptibilities uh, as well as some sort of external exposure and some dysfunction uh, that takes place in these individuals that causes the development of a cancer. Um, and then some of these things we know, and then there are a lot of unknowns in the development of carcinogenesis. A typical oral cancer, a squamous cell carcinoma, has hundreds of mutations, but it's only a handful of these mutations, roughly six to 10 that are considered to be driving mutations. Um, and these mutations are the ones that are driving this cancer forward. Um, and these mutations typically affect one of three genes, whether it be an oncogene, which I think of as the gas pedal in a car, all right? We're going down a highway. The gas pedal is going to just allow you to floor that car. It's going to allow for unregulated cell replication, okay? A tumor suppressor gene, uh, which I consider to be the brakes. So if you remove the brakes from the car, and you floor it, guess what? There's gonna be nothing to stop you. So that is a tumor suppressor gene, again, allowing for unregulated cell replication. And then the replication error repair genes, I think about on 75, if we removed all the traffic, removed all the police officers, oh, 75 is in Dallas. I forget that everybody's from all over the state. But um, if you remove the constraints of the laws and the police officers that are managing, making sure you go at the right speed limit, um, nobody's there to oversee any errors that may be taking place. Nobody's there to see that you're breaking the laws and you can floor it. And again, it can allow for replication of cells that are mutated and result in neoplasia or cancer development. So let's talk about oral cancer, all right? Oral cancer, I'm gonna break into two different parts, and, and then I'll talk about three distinct entities that are all gonna be the same type, squamous cell carcinoma, which arises from that epithelium uh, or that top layer of tissue, but I'm gonna talk about this when it affects the lips, which is very different from when it affects the rest of the oral cavity. And then we're gonna talk mostly at this first part about oral pharyngeal cancer, okay? Now the oral pharynx, it comprises of the soft palate, the posterior pharyngeal wall, the posterior one third of the tongue, and the tonsillar tissues, uh, the anterior posterior tonsillar pillar, and all of the components that are within the fossas there. Um, so that is the oral pharynx, okay? And this cancer, you can't talk Talk about it without talking about HPV. This is where HPV is significant when we talk about oral cancer. It really isn't oral cancer, it's oral pharyngeal cancer. Okay. Uh, oral pharyngeal carcinoma is now divided into HPV positive and HPV negative. HPV positive accounts for 70 to 80 percent of the carcinomas that arise in the oral pharynx, okay? Um, and the difference here is that the survival, the median survival for those individuals affected by HPV-associated oral pharyngeal carcinoma is almost sevenfold that of the ones that are HPV negative, okay? So it's a huge prognostic difference in the oral pharynx, not the oral cavity, the oropharynx, all right? This is the one, as I mentioned before, that's been increasing in incidence over the last decade. And we're seeing this um, in middle-aged Caucasian males. Sometimes the smoking history may or may not be there. They may not have the typical risk factors. And it's thought to be associated with sexual practices. So human papillomavirus, uh, for those of us uh, who aren't aware, it's a non-enveloped DNA virus with over 150 subtypes. And there's a few different families of this virus, but we kind of stratify it easily into low risk and high risk. And the high risk ones are the ones that typically can lead to an oncogenic event and the development of cancer in their persistence, okay? A lot of these individuals who are affected by a high risk um, HPV subtype will clear that infection, but it's in those individuals where we have persistent infection, do we end up seeing the development of disease or the development of this sort of oncogenic process? Now, 16 accounts for close to 90% of the HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancers, and it accounts for a great majority of the cervical carcinomas that we see in women as well. This is just a, a brief sort of model that breaks down how HPV affects the cells. It has these two proteins called E6 and E7. 
and it affects tumor suppressor genes and it makes them pretty much, it disables them, uh, to be honest. And as a result of that, you get unregulated cell proliferation and cell cycle progression. So I'm a pathologist. So I think you'd be hard pressed to go through a lecture without actually seeing some histology. So I figured I should show you some histology. Uh, you probably weren't uh, prepared to see cervical histology though. I think we were probably gonna focus on oral histology. So why am I showing you uh, a histologic section of the cervix? And it's to illustrate this point. It's HPV has a tendency to infect immature squamous epithelial cells. It has a hard time affecting keratinizing or mature squamous epithelium. If there's a break in epithelium, you can clearly get an infection of these basaloid immature cells. But this is where HPV infection occurs in the cervix. This is what we call the ectocervix, which is a mature squamous epithelium. And then our endocervix, which is more of a glandular uh, type of epithelium that we have there. And in between these two is what we call the squamocolumnar junction. And it's these immature sort of squamous epithelial cells that are the ones that are most susceptible to infection. So this is a, a portion of the tongue. This is actually a lingual tonsil. And if you look at our cervical model, this is our mature squamous epithelium, which is what we see here. But this epithelium that goes down here, this is our crypt epithelium. So just like the, the tonsillar tissues you back, have back in the pharynx, you have tonsillar tissue in your mouth, especially in the lingual tonsils and the posterior lateral aspects. And this is a tonsillar crypt. And this epithelium is very much phenotypically and histologically like your immature squamous epithelium that we see in the in the cervical squamocolumnar junction. It's not keratinizing. It's loose. It's what we call reticulated in its appearance. It allows for a lot of crossover because normally you're exposed to an antigen. And this is an area where let's say there's some sort of virus or bacterial infection. These cells, these lymphoid cells, all these blue dots are here to fight that infection. So you need a little bit of permeability here to educate these cells and then for them to ramp up and fight an infection. And that's why this epithelium is thin and immature in nature. And this is where HPV infection happens. And that's why we see it in the oral pharynx and we don't see it as frequently in the oral cavity. So going back to kind of the same point, HPV cancer and the oral cavity, a small percentage of carcinomas that arise in the oral cavity proper are, are HPV associated. 4% or less, uh, roughly speaking. However, currently, we're not able to appreciate a difference in prognosis in the ones that happen in the oral cavity, okay? Very different from the prognostic difference we see in the oral pharynx. And as a result of that, we don't necessarily routinely test for HPV in the oral cavity cancers. Because if there's no difference in biologic behavior, there's no difference in treatment um, at this point or no management differences for these patients. And the College of American Pathologists made that recommendation in 2017, then they've stood by it from a lot of the data we've been accumulating over the years. So we don't test for HPV in oral cavity proper. Again, because there's really no difference in biologic behavior that we've been, we've been able to prove so far. So who are you going to see um, in HPV-associated oropharyngeal carcinomas? More often, they're going to be considered these middle-aged individuals, so they may not be the classic older individuals that you see, but I think you could see a wide age range of individuals. Uh, more often, we see them in Caucasians, but that doesn't mean it's limited to that population, and they may not have that classic risk factor history of smoking, drinking, things like that. What do you look for in these patients? Unilateral enlargement of a pharyngeal tonsil on an oral exam. Uh, I routinely, every patient that comes into my practice, I give a thorough head and neck screening to, and I repeat that screening when they come in to see me, okay? Um, enlargement of the base of the tongue. If you're able to visualize it, great. The other big thing is digital palpation is key in your oral exam or your oral cancer screening. And then palpation of the neck levels, right? So one through six or seven, if we're going to include the infraclavicular nodes, um, the mediastinal nodes. But making sure that you're palpating uh, the regions of the neck where you can expect um, chains of lymph nodes to be. And then symptoms, asking the patient about any sort of dysphagia or issues with swallowing, which usually a patient will readily um, give you that information, any persistent sore throat or discomfort, any hoarseness in their voice that's persistent, um, or any sort of radiating ear pain, okay? These could all be signs and symptoms of an oropharyngeal cancer that can't be readily visualized. <clears throat> 
So when it is visualized, you may see something like this. Again, a unilateral enlargement of the tonsil. We really can't see the other side here, but let me change this to this fancy laser pointer. Here we go. So unilateral enlargement of the tonsil here, and it looks like there's some necrosis. Um, that unilateral enlargement, that asymmetrical sort of enlargement is a worrisome finding for malignancy. Um, and in this case, this was an oral pharyngeal carcinoma. This is a patient who has this large swelling in the posterior one third of the tongue, again, part of the oropharynx behind the circumvallate papilla. And it reminds me of a story uh, of an individual who was referred to my practice here. And he came in and he looked cachectic, like there was, you know, just skin and bones. He'd lost a lot of weight. Um, he, you know, openly admitted that he lost about 30 to 40 pounds in the last couple of months. Um, and he said he was here for a fungal infection in his mouth. And you look inside his mouth, um, and on first exam, I usually tell the patients, you know, stick your tongue out. And as soon as he stuck his tongue out, there was a deviation to the left. And I said, well, that's not normal. And so I said, can you stick your tongue out again, stick it out straight? And as, as soon as he sticks his tongue out, it just kind of goes off to the left. So intraorally, as I'm doing my exam, I can't see anything back on that posterior left side, which would cause a little bit of that deviation. Um, so as I stick my finger back there to palpate, and again, this is why digital palpation is really important. It is uncomfortable to the patient. Um, I've had exams like this done before myself. It's not comfortable, but ensuring the patient that this is necessary and this is something you're doing really goes a long way. Um, um, there's a good question about uh, tongue deviating to the side of the lesion. Excellent question. In my case, in the patient that I'm, I'm describing, it was actually deviation to that side. And I'll tell you, it's because there was, as soon as I palpated digitally back to the posterior aspect of the tongue, it became, it went from the soft, normal mucosal palpation where you have give to just a rock solid mass behind the circumvallate papilla that couldn't be visualized. So we couldn't visualize the entire mass, but it, you could tell it had kind of creeped to the floor of the mouth and that posterior aspect of the tongue. And so because of that, it had actually almost kind of ankylosed to a degree the tongue in that place, right? And so because you have this mass there, when he was protracting his tongue, it really was limited in motion and would go to the left in his situation. So we got him uh, a referral to UT Southwestern. By the time he actually had a scope done, um, he was found to have pretty much clinically advanced disease with widespread uh, organ metastases. So let me see here. Uh, the other important thing as part of our head and neck examination is not just evaluating, again, the intraoral components, but also the skin as well as the, the neck, right? And checking for palpable nodes. Oral pharyngeal cancers are known to produce uh, large metastatic foci within the cervical lymph nodes without ever seeing a visual uh, exuberant cancer in the, in the oral pharynx. So the oral pharyngeal cancers, are, one, are really hard to visualize, and sometimes they may be smaller primary cancers, but they have a tendency to metastasize early. And some of these, because they metastasize early, you'll actually find the lymph nodes before you actually find the primary cancer. So it's not uncommon in those cancers that you'll find uh, large lymph nodes, and then they'll go in and look at the oral pharynx to find a primary. So just a kind of a basic diagram uh, going and, and kind of describing the areas of the neck where we have um, our lymph nodes and the actually the face and the neck um, and making sure that you're palpating uh, these areas in your patients. This is an individual who had a recurrent um, metastatic squamous cell. Uh, his first primary was in the oral pharynx. Um, he did have some large nodal disease. And again, uh, it may not always be this obvious. But the signs of a worrisome lymph node are ones that are rock solid, that are immovable, um, or that um, are, are persistent, okay? So it's some of those situations that we need to at least uh, talk to a physician about maybe getting a referral for an ENT or getting a head and neck CT um, or some further imaging if you can't visualize anything in the oral cavity. Treatment by and large for uh, oral pharyngeal carcinomas, uh, surgical um, you know, intervention is typically still the mainstay if you can detect the primary, um, but there's a lot of radiation and chemotherapy that's being used to cure these patients. Sometimes radiation is a primary mode of treatment, depending on the 
on the size of the cancer itself. Um, and surgical can be conventional through our conventional intraoral approach um, uh, or otherwise complex approach, or it can be through robotic surgery. Uh, and that's gained a lot more traction these days. Um, and then radiation and chemotherapy, again, are, are often used in cases of HPV-associated carcinoma. When we first started learning about this cancer, it we learned that over, well, I guess when we first started learning about this cancer, one, it was aggressive, a lot of nodal disease very early. And so we started treating it heavily. Come to find out that these patients have such a good prognosis, especially with treatment with radiation and chemo, that we are now in a stage of considering de-escalation protocols where we're reducing the amount of chemo, reducing radiation, um, and improving our surgical methods in managing patients with oral pharyngeal disease. This is the difference between oral pharyngeal and oral cavity cancer. Um, if you look at everything as a whole, the survival rate for oral cancer, which people look up and patients will talk to you about is about 70%, close to 70%. Uh, but you need to break it down by sight. The lip will pull these numbers way, way up, as will the oral pharynx. 90% five-year survival rate with lip cancers because it is a skin-driven cancer. It is a result of sun damage. It's not like the cancers we get in the oral cavity. Uh, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the gums, and the other parts are the oral cavity cancers, and those are just below 60% in regards to five-year survival, right? The oral pharynx, the ones that are HPV-driven are 85%, as opposed to the ones that aren't, which are close to 55%, so closer to and below uh, the survival rates for oral cavity cancer proper. What about prevention? So I'm not here to talk to you in length about vaccination and vaccination protocols, but this is huge. Uh, Gardasil 9 has the high risk subtypes that most often result in cervical and or pharyngeal carcinoma. And it is quite protective in long-term studies so far. And the big thing here that's kind of unfortunate is that as of 2019, only 54% of adolescents have been adequately vaccinated, right? So this is preventative in, in regards to the prevention, potential prevention for oral pharyngeal as well as cervical cancer in the future. So we do have some studies that have come out, and I should, I should actually mention to you before I move on that this has been expanded to include the ages of 45. So this is a discussion that you can have with your physician um, about potentially becoming vaccinated for HPV uh, at an expanded schedule. Um, and I think they do a three dose, if I'm not mistaken, um, schedule for those individuals. Is it working? Huge publication out of a pretty reputable journal um, that talks about uh, a population level impact of herd effects of, of vaccination with HPV. And they looked at 60 million individuals and there is evidence of this working. There is a decrease in the number of uh, dysplastic lesions um, of the cervix among girls and women. And there is a decrease in the number of anogenital warts in men and women both that have been diagnosed as a result of a lot of these longitudinal studies. So this can only be extrapolated to oral pharyngeal cancer and cervical cancer in the future. So I think this, this really does show some benefit um, uh, to the population at large. All right, so now focusing on oral cancer, right? So oral cancer typically affects a few different sites that are considered to be the high risk sites. And many of you, many of you are probably aware of this, but the tongue and not the dorsum, but the lateral and ventral aspects of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the soft palate and retromolar trigone. And these things have, these sites specifically have a few things in common. One, the epithelium is the thinnest as it is anywhere in the oral cavity, okay? This is the thinnest epithelium out of any place in the oral cavity. It is non-keratinizing. That means that there's not an additional layer of mechanical protection here. And the other thing is any carcinogens we take in, the ones that we know about, the ones that we don't know about, dissolve in our saliva, and they pool in the floor of our mouth, expose themselves to the base of our tongue, the, the ventral aspect of our tongue, they bathe the lateral aspect of the tongue. And when we swallow, they go back to the retromolar trigone and mucosa, as well as the soft palate. So these are the areas that are going to be the high risk sites for the development of cancer. And those are the, pretty much the basic reasons why. Um, these cells in the basal cell layer are the ones that are actively replicating. And they're the ones who are most susceptible 
to acquiring mutations because their DNA is exposed in that situation, right? And so compare that to the cheek. This is a biopsy of normal cheek, which has a thin little layer of parakeratin, which is an additional mechanical protection. But also look at the thickness here. If you have a carcinogen out here in the oral cavity, for it to actually cause some sort of carcinogenic effect or mutagenic effect, I mean, it has to get down to here, right? So this is, this is the big reason why we have these high risk sites um, of the oral cavity. So these are the known risk factors, um, tobacco, um, alcohol, chronic iron deficiency, diet, sunlight, um, and again, sunlight, talking about the skin and lip cancers, other immunologic factors. And then there's a lot of others that go into this. The classics we all know about, smoking and drinking, um, I always like to say that I think I look that smooth when I have a glass of scotch, um, but uh, my dad always informed me that I didn't. So just a personal tidbit about myself. Um, so tobacco, uh, smoked uh, is what we're going to talk about first. And aggressive ad campaigns, which everybody has seen all over the news, all over the television, I mean, in papers, we've done a really good job about um, aggressively going after cigarette smoking. And there's been a big decline um, in people that are smoking um, to 14% in 2017 to from 42 um, in, in the mid 60s. It still remains the most preventable cause of death in the United States, and it accounts for roughly 30% of all cancers. Okay, and, and it's a higher number of oral and oral pharyngeal cancers as a result of direct exposure. Uh, in many cases, alcohol alone still has an increased risk of the development of cancer. Uh, and this is termed to be alcohol abuse, where you have more than four alcoholic beverages a day. And that relative risk is pretty high. It's 15 fold compared to an individual who is not abusing alcohol. Remember ethanol or alcohol itself can metabolize into different products that are known to be carcinogens. Other than that, a lot of mixed beverages um, have different uh, carcinogenic constituents uh, that can be uh, mutagenic on their own. And additionally, some people, if you, I mean, I've done this, I marinate meat in alcohol in some cases, and that's to increase the permeability. So there's a thought that this could be playing a role in increasing epithelial permeability um, and, and increase the chances of, of carcinogenesis in some patients. Very good question about vaping. You, you're staying way on top of it. That's going to be my next topic. So I'm going to talk about that next. Um, excellent. Excellent. I love the feedback. Um, mouthwash. This is a tricky one. Uh, a lot of patients I've had, I've had people come into my practice or other individuals, colleagues talk about mouthwash and the risk of um, oral cancer. Uh, oral pharyngeal cancer. And I, th I think I don't close the door on anything, but some of the studies that have really heavy data about mouthwash and oral cancer have a little bit of trouble in some of their, um, the, the, some of their study development. And that's the basic pro I mean, I, I think the basic problem is that you don't control for people who are smoking. Uh, people who are heavy smokers oftentimes will use mouthwash to mask that smell. And so if you're not controlling for things like that, yeah, you use your mouthwash four times a day, but you also smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. So you have to have really well-developed controlled studies to figure out whether mouthwash alone is going to be enough uh, of an agent to cause oral cancer. And again, there's a lot of variables in there. So you have to be aware of what we're reading uh, when it comes to some of these scientific publications. All right, e-cigarettes. So unfortunately, um, and kind of fortunately, we've been around long enough um, that we don't know the real long-term chronic effects of e-cigarette use, but we're starting to get an idea. Um, there's many different constituents. There was a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016 that they looked at the different components uh, of these e-cigarette and vaping tools. Um, and, and they found that alone, there are components of each of these things that are carcinogenic that can cause cancer, that have the potential to cause mutations and result in cancer. Um, there's a lot of different things in regards to flavoring agents, um, different oils, different acids that are being added to this. Along with that, you get metal release from the heating coils or wicks uh, that seeps into the, the vapor itself. 
And so it's clear at that time that they mentioned that it has the biologic effects uh, that can lead to potential adverse health health effects over time. Um, that being said, um, you guys should probably be aware that in 2020 of last year, we started seeing a slew of lung injuries in patients who were using e-cigarettes or vaping. Um, and this is directly a result of a component of something that they were using within that, uh, that actual tobacco product, okay? And it was actually a THC-based product, but it was causing massive lung damage in some individuals, which was actually fatal in a number of uh, younger, younger folks. Um, there have been some case reports out there of oral cancer in patients who are vaping. I think it's very early, but knowing that these components can be carcinogenic, I think it's a function of time before we see this. Now, e-cigarettes and vaping, I think it's a pan, not pandemic, but it's at least an ap epidemic here in the States. Um, huge numbers in regards to increase of individuals who are using these products. Um, does anybody know how these products came on the market? These initially were pushed onto the market without a huge FDA overview. Um, um, because it was thought that this could be something that could deter individuals from smoking. And so because of that, some of the stuff was overlooked in regards to advertising these things. And many of these things were advertised as really attractive uh, products to youth, juice boxes and these USB type jewel pods and things like that with exotic flavors that in hopes that they're attracting uh, the youth, which they did a good job of doing. 38.3% um, uh, tobacco product use. Um, and that was the growth that we saw um, over 27 to 2017 to 2018. One jewel pod has just the same amount of nicotine as one pack of cigarettes, okay? Now, they're going to start regulating these products a little bit more heavily. They've already implemented certain rules and regulations in regards to marketing. And when you do that, you make this harder to access for these individuals. And now I know in at least, uh, you know, some of the states here, we have an age of 21 for buying tobacco. Um, but this is one of those things that if you take away something that has essentially um, addicted an individual to nicotine, they're going to use for look for an alternative source. So this is something to be concerned about going forward um, uh, in the future. It was a question about hookah and uh, nicotine bases or non-nicotine bases. Um, it depends. Again, a hookah is one of those things that it can have a lot of variable products and additives in it. Um, so again, not a direct correlation or as strong of a link as smoking uh, cigarettes itself, but it, you do have to be kind of a little bit aware of what is in the product itself. So smokeless tobacco, um, it, it still carries a risk on its own. Um, and contrary to popular belief, it, you know, some people say it's a, it's a better alternative than smoking because the chance of cancer is lower. Uh, it's hard to argue that the chance of cancer is lower, but it's not zero. Uh, the relative risk of cancer development in a patient who has used smokeless tobacco is still two to 26 fold than that of a person who hasn't. Um, there were some Swedish studies that looked at their moist snuff there, which is actually regulated as a food product. Uh, in Sweden. Um, and because of that, they're required to put all of their ingredients on, on the labels. And uh, their products are, are different than some of the American products that we have, kind of like our standard Copenhagen's and things like that, which do have a lot more additives um, and potential carcinogenic agents um, in their ingredients list. Um, being aware uh, that in the United States, smokeless tobacco is required to have at least one of the following warning uh, warnings in two areas of their um, the, the smokeless tobacco cans themselves. And so one of them clearly talks about cancer. The other one talks about gum disease, uh, it not being a safe alternative and addictive. So there are cans out on the market right now that have nothing about carcinogenesis, uh, nothing about cancer, um, that clearly just have something about it being addictive and uh, it being an altern not being a safe alternative to smokeless or smoking cigarettes. So this is something that, uh, again, some patients will come to you. I've had a patient come to me with a can and he's like, doesn't say anything about cancer on it. 
Well, it's because this is the way that it's been regulated through the FDA for their advertising. They're required to rotate these things quarterly, um, but there are cans out there on the shelves that don't have anything about cancer. I'm here to tell you that it is still carcinogenic. Systemic conditions. There's certain inheritable or heritable conditions um, that uh, can lead to the development or increased development of cancer, um, oral cancer specifically. Immunosuppression can do that, and so can chronic iron deficiency. All right. Other risk factors: if an individual has had a history of a prior cancer, it increases their risk um, by by nine to twenty-five percent of developing another upper air digestive tract cancer. This is an individual who had a tongue cancer that involved the floor of the mouth as well as portion of the anterior mandibular alveolus. Um, and this patient also ended up developing a secondary cancer on the palate, which is again, the hard palate is not a typical location, uh, but this patient had a cancer develop uh, here as well. And this is the whole idea of field cancerization is that yes, you have a cancer develop on the left side of your tongue, but that cancer is the result of a few things coming together. And if we think one of those things is a carcinogen, guess what? The rest of your upper aerodigestive tract was probably exposed to that carcinogen as well. So the rest of those cells may be just as susceptible. And that's why these individuals do have a higher risk of developing a second cancer. So these are the pre-malignant lesions that we're going to kind of talk about, leukoplakia and a specific type called proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. Actinic keratosis is a skin uh, pre-malignant lesion, and we'll talk about that in regards to the lip, and then erythroplakia. So leukoplakia, uh, by definition, is a white patch or plaque that can't be characterized clinically or pathologically as any other disease, okay? It is a clinical diagnosis. It is not a microscopic or histologic diagnosis. And when I say something is a leukoplakia, I am saying that it is pre-malignant, okay? Um, and that can be on biopsy, either dysplastic, which means that we have histologic evidence or microscopic evidence of precancerous change, or not. It could just show some increased keratosis. And that doesn't mean that it's not precancerous. That if it is a leukoplakia, it is still precancerous. And those that don't have dysplasia still have a small rate of malignant transformation. So not all white lesions that we see are the result of uh, precancerous sort of changes. This is one where we clearly go through our evaluation and ask, you know, how long has this been there? We try to wipe it off to see if it's something that's wipeable. Uh, this individual had a sharp tine on this cusp, and this was back when gold work was excellent, and it still is, uh, but just not as technique driven anymore. Um, and so we clearly smoothed off that cusp, and guess what? This went away. So not a precancerous lesion. So just taking a step back, making sure that you're evaluating for other causes that could result in a precancerous, or not precancerous, but a white lesion in the oral cavity. Leukoplakia is the most common pre-malignant lesions affecting the oral cavity, a global prevalence of about 2 to 3%, which is close to 234 million people. Okay, so two to three percent sounds a lot smaller, but when you say 234 million people, that, that's a lot of people that are affected uh, by this lesion. Okay, majority of these lesions have been associated with tobacco use. Uh, only 10% roughly have an unknown etiology. So who are you going to see in your practice? This is where it starts to get important for us to, to perk up and pay attention. Two thirds of these individuals are going to be males, often middle aged or elderly, um, most commonly observed after the age of 40. Where do we typically see these? lesions on the lip, uh, buccal mucosa or gingiva. Um, anytime we see it in a high risk site, those are the ones that will typically show evidence of precancerous change under the microscope or evidence of carcinoma um, or cancer on, on biopsy. Okay, And those are the ones that are going to be found at the high risk sites like the lateral ventral tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the lip vermilion. There's a big publication in the, in the Journal of Cancer in 1975, where they looked at over 3,000 leukoplakias, and uh, dysplasia or cancer, frank carcinoma, was found in close to 20% of these, okay? The estimated malignant transformation rates vary depending on a lot of different factors, degree of dysplasia, adequate sampling of a lesion. So there's a lot of variables that go into this. And if you look at a dysplasia, again, dysplasia is a histologic diagnosis that we give. And it talks about precancerous changes that we're able to visualize under the microscope. Um, and we 
And we have a three-tier system in the oral cavity, mild uh, being the earliest stages, moderate, and then either severe or in situ where it's involving the full epithelial thickness. And they all carry this statistical rate of malignant transformation. To me, this under represents what we're looking at in regards to, or it kind of, it downgrades the, the name of a leukoplakia or the designation of a, of a diagnosis like this. If you say, okay, this is mild dysplasia and the malignant transformation rate, which is published is, you know, somewhere between one and 5% or, or less than 5%, then people are not as concerned. That being said, I, I tell my patients, I don't know if you're in that 5% that is going to undergo malignant transformation. So this is why it's so important to pay attention to stuff like this, that yes, while the statistics are low for malignant transformation, I can't accurately predict whether you're going to be the person who develops cancer or not. And that's something that you don't want to necessarily take a chance on. This is uh, what was called a simplified diagrammatic view. Uh, insert laugh here. This is what they called simplified in one of our journals. It was a it was an oral path, oral surgery, oral radiology journal. And I tell individuals to put this in three, or if you're really imaginative, in four dimensions and rotate these all on different axes. And that's pretty much our understanding of how cancer develops. Okay. So it really isn't that simplified. It really is more of a complex process. So these are the things we need to pay attention to. Uh, findings that are indicative of a higher propensity for malignant transformation. The clinical appearance is big, whether it's non-homogenous or not. When it's non-homogenous, that means it has irregular architectural features or speckling red-white changes or frank ulceration. These are suspicious findings, and they indicate that there may be a higher chance of malignant transformation. The site, lateral ventral tongue, floor of mouth, soft palate, high risk sites for the development of cancer. So if you find this lesion in those sites, your flag should be a lot higher. Your suspicion should be a lot higher for uh, a malignant transformation. Females, uh, especially females without that social, not that non-contributory social history, that risk factor history. Uh, if they have a leukoplakia in one of these locations, my index of suspicion is much higher. And then older individuals, older than 60 as well. Uh, again, understanding that the younger population is not immune to the development of precancerous lesions. So this is kind of our, our basic uh, diagram of, of leukoplakia. And this is kind of a smooth and thin homogenous leukoplakia. And over time, they can have some fissuring. And some of them may present with this more prominent architectural verruciform or verrucous change. Um, and then you start to see some speckling. And then in the later stages, some, and this isn't necessarily a staged process, but some of these lesions may be just purely red. And that's what we refer to as an erythroplakia. But each of these things increases the chance or likelihood that there's dysplasia on biopsy or cancer uh, on your first biopsy, incisional biopsy. So this is a fairly homogenous leukoplakia. This is a 56-year-old female left lateral tongue, uh, and this was biopsied, and it was shown to be mild dysplasia. Okay, so the earliest stages of a dysplastic process in this individual. Here's one that looks somewhat similar, uh, a little bit more homogenous and opaque, um, but uh, widespread, a little bit more diffuse, and this was also biopsied, and it was a mild dysplasia in this individual. This is one, and this is a particular appearance that I want to kind of draw your attention to, but it looks kind of like dried mud or, you know, what you find in a dried riverbed. Uh, it has this fissuring that's really unique, uh, which is suspicious for a precancerous process at really well-defined margins, but this was mild to moderate, actually, dysplasia when this was biopsied in this young gentleman. It may be subtle, but you can probably pick up that there's some irregularity on the surface, and this lesion kind of extends to a, a few areas adjacent to it as well. And under the microscope, we can really pick up that architectural pattern. And it really does look more verrucous. And this actually showed evidence of mild dysplasia. We have some intensely staining nuclei, some basal or hyperplasia, all features that we associate with dysplasia. Interesting case here. Um, uh, the doctor had done a biopsy on this and got back a diagnosis of hyperkeratosis. That means there's just increased keratin production. That's it. No atypical cytologic change, no dysplasia. So they said, okay, well, we've excised this. They excised it up to here. Uh, 
and I want to draw your attention to this area here that's adjacent or abutting that tooth. They excise this lesion and let the patient heal and they put in implants. And lucky for us, they had documentation of the implants over the years. And so you see in 2015, they had placed an implant. Notice here in 2017, next to that molar, going back to that photo, this is the area here. And if you go forward, we have a little bit more bone loss here. We're also starting to see a little bit more bone loss around this implant. 2019, that tooth had been extracted and we have some degree of remodeling, but we still have a lot of bone loss here. In 2020, finally, this implant was just mobile and it was extracted and they submitted that tissue, which they were thinking was an inflammatory um, and it was squamous cell carcinoma. So this was a case where really they had done everything they could initially. Um, and in, again, histologically, it didn't show evidence of dysplastic change, um, but this was a case of carcinoma developing in this lesional process. Here's a patient who had a previous cancer resection, implants placed, and they have these pre-malignant lesions, and these were dysplastic. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into implant placement and planning. For those of you that are doing this, uh, be really cautious about what you're doing. Don't be in a rush to uh, place these implants. Make sure you're aware of any sort of lesional tissue that's in this area uh, prior to doing procedures like this. Um, this was a patient that underwent immediate implant placement after extraction. Um, the, the white lesion that was there prior to was not completely addressed. This was a really unfortunate case um, that had moderate uh, dysplasia on biopsy. They tried to or attempted to remove this lesion and it came back. And then the patient eventually developed a little bit more bone loss and they ended up having to remove the implants uh, because there was just this extensive white lesion uh, that developed in this area, as well as the bone loss that was occurring, which was more suspicious for carcinoma. This looks worrisome, uh, really irregular surface architectural changes. Uh, they sampled one area, no evidence of precancerous change. And that's the other point here is if you have a larger lesion, we got to make sure that we can get representative sections of that process. We get a good snapshot or an overview of what's going on. So sampling a few different sites is probably a good idea in an extensive lesion. And again, even in the absence of dysplasia, this lesion is going to have a higher chance of malignant transformation because of the architectural pattern that we're seeing here. This is one that was excised and it was mild dysplasia. And then the patient, uh, they thought they excised all the lesion the surgeon did, went back and took out the rest of this after that was pointed out to them. And it actually showed mild to moderate dysplasia on the remaining portion of this, which looks fairly innocuous uh, clinically. This is a patient diagnosed with mild dysplasia on an incisional biopsy here. And they were followed, um, which is fair to do in some of these cases. Um, and then in 2019, they came back and it was this mass-like lesion with severe epithelial dysplasia, and it was worrisome for uh, cancer in this case. This really highlights that irregularity that you can see in some of these lesions. And anytime we see something like this, we have a higher index of suspicion that there's gonna be dysplasia or carcinoma, okay? So this is a good example of a non-homogeneous leukoplakia. Here's another one, really interesting case with this white lesion and some distant history of potential surgery. Um, this has recently been described in the literature as a worrisome finding, this really distinct white sort of lesion along the marginal gingiva. Uh, but then they have this really interesting kind of circular, almost artifactual white area here. They decided to excise this portion of tissue and it was actually found to be invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so a fairly innocuous lesion, but it looks like it had grown along the sulcular aspect. There was bone loss, and this looked almost like it was probably perforating through that gingival aspect. Um, the tumor was kind of perforating through that gingival, external gingival aspect here. Red-white change, again, a worrisome sign, and this was moderate dysplasia. Again, non-homogeneous leukoplakias. Very similar to the last one. My index of suspicion for cancer is probably not as high, but for, for dysplasia, it's, it's fairly high. And this was biopsied and it was carcinoma on biopsy. This is an interesting case that we've had here in our clinics. Uh, it, was, it was a patient in 2018 with this extensive leukoplakia that over the course of time, they had tried to manage with some topical chemotherapeutics. And that was in 2018 and 2019, she ended up developing these areas here um, that are a little bit more 
uh, different from the rest. And from January to March, it became a pretty distinct lesion. Um, and it was very worrisome for invasive carcinoma when it was biopsied. Uh, so again, it's hard to predict progression rates, uh, but anytime you see any sort of evolution or any sort of irregularity, our index of suspicion is much higher. This is a gentleman who got in touch with us here um, from Pennsylvania. He's, a, he's an attorney and uh, he had been biopsied multiple times with a diagnosis of a lichenoid process. Um, which is lichen planus like, okay? And that's a pattern of inflammation we see in inflammatory diseases. Um, interestingly, we can see that pattern of inflammation also in response to dysplastic change, which not all pathologists are aware of, but should be aware of. Um, but anyways, he was diagnosed as having this inflammatory condition, uh, quote unquote, with overlying candidal infection. Uh, and you look at this and you're thinking, man, could he have chewed on this? And I think that's something to consider. But look at the granularity of this. Look at the extension along the lip and the overall appearance. Uh, we asked for him to send us his most recent biopsies. We signed them out as dysplastic. Uh, I talked to the surgeon per personally uh, and told him our suspicions. They ended up doing a wide resection and found that there was carcinoma uh, in, in the bulk of this tissue mass here. So this is kind of a, a, a really star sort of slide to focus in on. Um, and it was published by the Academy of Oral Medicine uh, a couple of years back. And it's kind of a, a brief synopsis of what you should do with leukoplakias. Uh, the annual malignant transformation rate of leukoplakias as a whole is low, one to 3%. 40% uh, of leukoplakias will show dysplasia or carcinoma on biopsy, which is a lot higher than some of the earlier studies. They do recommend multiple biopsies of larger lesions or those that are non-homogenous, making sure to sample those different appearing sites. And then the clinician should send clinical images with uh, their biopsies to the specimen or to the pathologist. And then lastly, a follow-up is going to be indefinite for these patients. You're going to follow them for life. Okay, these are going to be the patients that uh, you're going to see for the rest of your your practicing life here. All right, actinic keratoses are the skin lesions that develop uh, that are precancerous in nature. And uh, oftentimes we'll see this in a lot of the population here in Texas. We like to be outdoors and we don't often uh, put in UV protective sun balm or lip balm or anything like that. And so you'll see a blending of that lip line, you'll lose that definition, and then you'll start to see some white changes. And this actually here is an example of mild dysplasia in the setting of an actinic keratosis on this individual's lip. Uh, it's really nice when I get feedback from former students. This is a former student of mine. She found this on a family friend. He said, ah, it's been there for a while. It doesn't really bother me. And she said, you know, I think this is potentially a precancerous lesion. You should get it biopsied. And it was actually mild dysplasia. Okay. So it already had the microscopic features of precancerous change and something classic that you can find on just your overall clinical evaluation. Again, remember to pay attention to the patient's skin that's exposed. Make sure you're looking at those things also because um, you may be the only healthcare provider they see uh, for a while, okay? This is a, a former dentist who spent a lot of time on the golf course who ended up getting this biopsied and it was actually severe dysplasia. Um, he'd been kind of doctoring it himself for a while. This is an interesting case of a 36-year-old female um, who had this non-healing sort of ulcerative excoriative lesion um, for quite some time. She said, you know, I've had it for probably five years, but maybe longer. It seems like it heals, but then it kind of comes back. It never really heals. It doesn't look overly suspicious. It's not in your face for cancer, but the fact that there's this persistence and we were never able to identify a cause it, it almost is mandatory then to figure out what's going on here. And so they did a biopsy and it was actually superficially invasive cancer. No history of smoking, no history of drinking, uh, but this was an individual, again, sun exposed skin and just had enough early damage and probably some underlying issues or factors that contributed to the development of cancer in this patient. So the patient, again, uh, outside of the oral cavity, but had this lesion that was treated by a dermatologist topically or, or just superficially with cryo, and they just froze that off. Well, she presented to the oral surgeon in September with this mass. Again, we're not seeing the skin lesion there, but you can see from that aspect, it's a pretty sizable mass, 
excuse me. And uh, the surgeon thought maybe this is something coming from the lip. So he excised it from the intraoral approach uh, in an effort to kind of maintain cosmetics on the lip. And that's the tumor bed. He said that when he got into it, he felt like it was continuous with the overlying skin. And it was really hard to define that superior border of it um, going towards the cutaneous aspect. And on biopsy, this was carcinoma. Okay. So this was a, an example of a skin cancer that had kind of grown down through uh, the abicularis oris muscle of the lips. All right. Proliferative verrucous leukoplakia is a potentially malignant condition that shows variable clinical and histopathologic features. Um, it is a multifocal leukoplakic process that is aggressive and it's relentless, and it has a relatively high rate of malignant transformation. Okay. Typically, we find these in older women, and uh, they typically don't have that classic risk factor of smoking and drinking, okay? The most often sites that you'll see this are, interestingly enough, the gingiva buccal mucosa, okay? Not the high-risk sites for the development of cancer. So we're seeing a lot of this on the gingival tissues and the buccal mucosa. It can affect the tongue and other sites as well, um, but these are the sites that uh, we often see this on. Clinically, it can start out as a solitary lesion, Okay, but oftentimes in this disease process, you have multifocal involvement or generalized involvement, and then they develop into more non-homogeneous leukoplakic lesions with time. Again, let me draw your attention to that kind of dried mud uh, appearance here that shows that fissuring. This is worrisome for uh, a, a pre-malignant process. This could easily be overlooked by some individuals as, oh, well, they have this on their cheek, they have this on their other cheek, it's lichen planus. It's a white lesion affecting two areas, it's an inflammatory process. That's not the case here, okay? We look at this gentleman's cheeks, and then we look at the anterior maxilla, or anterior mandible here. And this is a pre-malignant process uh, that we call proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, all right? And this is very challenging to treat in these individuals. Again, be aware of this. Uh, not all multifocal white lesions are, you know, lichen planus or inflammatory. It could potentially be something like this, which is a pre-malignant process. There's another one in the left maxilla, the left mandible, and then look at the right mandible. And the unfortunate thing about this, as I mentioned before, um, your body has a tendency to try to fight this. And so it'll produce an inflammatory response that'll look like lichen planus. And this gentleman was biopsied here, which showed dysplasia, and it was biopsied here. And if he only sampled this site and he told me it was lichen planus and I didn't have photos, I could sign it out as lichen planus. It wasn't dysplastic. There was no microscopic evidence of atypical cytologic change. And there was this pattern of inflammation, which looked like lichen planus. In reality, that was in response to this pre-neoplastic or pre-malignant process. So there has to be clinical correlation with these cases um, and make sure that you give the pathologist as much information as possible when you're doing these biopsies. So the treatment of PVL, people have tried multiple things, uh, chemotherapeutics like retinoic acid or retinoid family, um, as well as other medications, uh, photodynamic therapy, cryo, laser, uh, surgical excision, but inevitably a lot of these individuals progress or recur and develop cancer. So this is a very relentless disease process that we're trying to figure out what is exactly causing it. Erythroplakia uh, is, you know, the opposite it is a red lesion. Uh, red patch is literally what this means uh, without an obvious cause, okay? Similar risk factors to leukoplakia, typically seen in the same population of individuals. Uh, oftentimes, you're going to find these in high-risk sites, okay? The important thing about erythroplakias are that 90%, if not more than 90%, are going to be carcinoma, so already cancer, carcinoma in situ, or high-grade dysplasia on biopsy, okay? Same group that published uh, on a leukoplakia did a nice publication with uh, many cases of erythroplakia, and uh, they found out that a lot of these were going to be um, cancer or high-grade dysplasia on biopsy, all right? Clinically, they're going to look erythematous um, with variable sort of demarcated borders, maybe a little bit velvety um, in regards to the, the, the way they've been described. And more often than not, they're going to be asymptomatic in these individuals. So imagine something like this. Well, first thing that comes to your mind, could this be inflammatory? Sure, it could. But if there's this degree of inflammation, it's likely that the patient would be symptomatic, okay? Uh, again, no reason for this to be here in this patient. It was biopsied and it was carcinoma in situ. This, they thought it was a denture, 
Um, you know, maybe the denture flange had been hitting there by the time it was referred to us, um, one of my mentors, actually, uh, they put the denture in place and realized that this is actually posterior to the actual denture. So there's no way that this was a result of mechanical trauma um, or pressure trauma from that. And they biopsied this. And this was also high grade dysplasia on biopsy. Some of these are a little bit more innocuous a red lesion that could easily be overlooked in the floor of the mouth. But again, floor of the mouth, high risk site. So our index of suspicion is a little bit higher. And there's another example of a carcinoma in situ. One thing I wanna show you guys here is kind of this granular punctate appearance that you see. It looks like it's kind of studded. Um, that's something that is very unique that I found um, in a lot of cancers and even carcinoma in situ. And this was biopsied in the floor of the mouth and this was cancer on biopsy. Another example that sort of granular appearance, a little bit more white here. This patient also has this ulceration, wasn't aware of it. And this is another example of a cancer that was biopsied. All right, tobacco pouch keratosis. Um, this is something that uh, we see a, an awful lot in the South. Um, and not all of these lesions will develop into precancerous processes, but the habit itself is a risk factor for the development of cancer. 98% of the lesions that are not intensely and opaque white can resolve if you stop the habit or stop placement of that habit in that particular area within two to three weeks, okay? Anything that persists, I would consider to be a leukoplakia or a precancerous lesion. So these are the typical lesions we're gonna see in these patients. And I'm sure you guys have seen uh, many of these through the, through the course of years um, or in your practices. Sometimes they can be a little bit more edematous like this one here. And again, when they're this edematous and this kind of faint, a lot of times when you remove the habit, these will resolve on their own within a few weeks. These are the ones that'll probably stick around and require monitoring, uh, if not biopsy. And again, these sites are not immune. This is a carcinogenic product, and this is a squamous cell carcinoma uh, developing in this patient's area of smokeless tobacco use. Here's another one where the patient placed the smokeless tobacco here and developed this gingival carcinoma uh, in that area. And then this is a good one because it still highlights the fact that there's still smokeless tobacco that he's using uh, in this area when he came in for this biopsy, and this was carcinoma on biopsy also. So it doesn't, uh, it, you know, smokeless tobacco is not without its risks. It, it is a carcinogenic habit, and it can develop into cancer. So what's the best, best way to detect premalignant lesions? I'm going to kind of just briefly go over this since we're running a little behind. Um, there's a lot of different adjuncts that are out there. Um, each one of these comes with its own understanding of its techniques, as well as its pitfalls um, of false positive and false negative findings. Uh, brush cytology can be uh, beneficial in some cases, but it doesn't really give you an adequate amount of information to um, assess and continually manage patients. Tissue reflectance can have its set of false positive and false negatives. Um, and then some of the biomarker studies, you can have increased biomarkers in uh, processes that are not precancerous that are elevated. So certain, certain markers that they use can be elevated in non-cancerous pro, uh, processes as well. So understanding these things is really important if you're gonna utilize this in your practice. In 2017 in JADA, we at least published that none of the available adjuncts demonstrated sufficient diagnostic accuracy to use them consistently in your practice to triage or evaluate lesions in the oral cavity, okay? And this was a, a pretty high um, evidence-based clinical uh, study or clinical overview and study of all the products that were out on the market at the time. And I, I think it is pretty impactful. So what does that mean? That means use your eyes, use your hands, um, you know, this is something that is really critically important um, and photo document. Uh, it's not that hard to take some photos and upload them into your chart, make sure you're keeping track of what the patient presents with and what it looks like at these appointments. So the treatment of precancerous lesions, conventional surgical excision, uh, cryosurgery, laser ablation, photodynamic therapy, people have used everything. Nowadays, there have been some clinical trials across the country in patients that have proliferative rucous leukoplakia or persistent big 
precancerous lesions uh, where they're using systemic immunotherapy. There's one at Dana-Farber uh, that was done. There's a couple that have been done at MD Anderson. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities that are out there and we're moving towards a localized way to manage this. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that is going undergoing clinical trials currently uh, for approval, hopefully in the future um, in regards to management. The most frustrating thing about management of precancerous disease or pre-malignant lesions is that there's no standard protocol. And because there's no standard protocol, there's no way that we can accurately take care of these patients and ensure that we don't have patients develop cancer, okay? Uh, a lot of people will say it's mild dysplasia. Some of these lesions undergo resolution on their own, uh, which is documented in the literature. So they'll just watch the patient or they'll tell the patient, nothing to worry about, we'll keep an eye on you. They lose the patient to follow up. Inevitably, the patient comes back to their, pain, their practice with uh, oral cancer. So there, there's just not a standard protocol that's been developed because of the degree of difficulty um, in agreement for a lot of these things. So this is our last portion of this. Uh, despite our best practices, you're gonna see patients, um, or despite your best efforts, I should say, you're gonna see patients in your practice that are gonna present with undiagnosed cancer, okay? So what do you look for? What should we look for uh, that's a suspicious lesion for cancer? Leukoplakia, right? Any of the precancerous lesions, erythroplakia, erythroleukoplakia, any of those lesions uh, should be suspicious for cancer. Non-healing ulcerative lesions. If there's a non-healing ulcer, we have to figure out why is it non-healing, okay? Mass type lesions, anything that's producing a mass effect and is typically fixed or is locally aggressive should be suspicious for cancer. Any sort of destructive lesion without an obvious source or cause, okay? Anything like that should be suspicious and needs to be uh, referred for biopsy if you're not doing the biopsy them yourselves. So sometimes it's obvious. This is a patient who's uh, immunocompromised because of bone marrow transplantation, and he has this large sort of granular ulcerated mass on his tongue, and it's a squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes it's complicated. This is a patient who's seen a dermatologist for two, three years. They had been treating it. He finally went to an oral surgeon and the oral surgeon was aware that the dermatologist was seeing it, but he said, man, it really isn't healing. It hasn't looked any better. We need to biopsy this. And thankfully he did. It was superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. So this is one of those things that you need to be aware of. Um, and and it, it's not always as obvious um, as we may seem uh, or as we may think. Here's a gingival lesion uh, and not really that obvious, but some necrosis or some white yellow change that looks different on the margin. And you look at this on the radiograph, really localized bone loss in this region, which is another red flag. Um, and this was biopsied and this was carcinoma. Another one here on the gingiva. Um, and again, this sort of granular red white appearance that looks a little bit studded, like it has these little papules of white um, intermixed amongst that lesional area. And this was another example of carcinoma. And here's another one coming out um, from that buccal aspect involving the furco uh, or the furcal area here. And you look at a radiograph and we have extensive bone loss just in this region. The rest of their periodontal health is relatively okay all red flags, okay? And then this was another carcinoma in this individual. This is a really challenging case where this patient has multifocal disease um, involving just the mandible, uh, the buccal mucosa, and, and some of the soft tissues posteriorly. Um, but this was an initial uh, photo from the referring physician, um, and then uh, initial visit with our clinic here, and this was a pre-op. We decided to do a laser ablation, or they decided to do a laser ablation. And so they ablated a lot of this superficial lesion in October of 2019. This is the one-week follow-up. One-week follow-up. We have regrowth. And then one month, we have that thickening, that thickened appearance, almost like you didn't do anything. Okay. And then lo and behold, over the course of time, this developed into this large fungating sort of lesion, which was signed out as carcinoma when they did a biopsy here, okay? That first biopsy they had done before they did the laser ablation just showed mild dysplasia, so the earliest changes under the microscope, but clinically, this lesion is extremely worrisome for malignant transformation. And that's a good example of a Verrucus-type carcinoma that ended up developing uh, in this patient. Here's one that could be easily written off as a reactive lesion on the gum here. 
And uh, the surgeon was just a little bit concerned. He said, you know, it doesn't quite look like a typical inflammatory process. Really nothing on the x-ray that looks overly worrisome, but I'm going to biopsy it. And thankfully he did because this was a squamous cell carcinoma. Here's an example that is more obvious where we have this destructive lesion that's causing dehiscence um, and ulceration of the floor of the mouth and the anterior mandibular alveolus. Here's one where we have a mass type lesion, uh, but you see some diffuse change in the surrounding mucosa as well. And this is a large squamous cell carcinoma uh, in the ventral tongue floor of the mouth region of this individual. I think this is the one that is a 31 or 32 year old Hispanic male. Um, presented with this lesion, his physician wasn't concerned about it. He's 32, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink. I know I, it's probably some sort of trauma, you bit it. Well, it was asymptomatic, it was persistent. Uh, and the surgeon said, you know, with, without any history, without looking at your age, looking at this lesion, I think this looks like cancer and it needs to be biopsied. And it was biopsied. And again, no risk factors that we're aware of. Um, and this was cancer in this young individual here. This is one that has a little bit more of a different appearance, but it's causing this destructive lesion that was kind of burrowing down uh, into the bone uh, of the anterior mandible and, and causing th these teeth to become loose over time. And this was another squamous cell carcinoma. This is an interesting case where they've extracted the teeth because they thought it was periodontal related. So they extracted the teeth and they put a bridge and said, well, it should probably heal. And it didn't. And looking at the patient clinically, when they were referred to the oral surgeon, uh, I think there's no question here, but this was uh, a squamous cell carcinoma that was probably squamous cell carcinoma all along, okay? So again, looking at the patient's overall bone level, their periodontal health, if they have a localized area, not to say that it can't be inflammatory, but that should at least raise our suspicion for something that's non-inflammatory and potentially more malignant, uh, like a carcinoma. Is a gentleman that walked into the dental school years ago, um, and I think part of this is uh, a fact of the individual themselves coming to terms with their disease. Uh, clearly, there's some teeth just floating here, and this irregular resorptive lesion of the left maxilla and maxillary sinus. And clinically, when you look inside his mouth, we have this large fungating mass, uh, which was uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. A little bit more innocuous, but red-white changes. Uh, and when you palpate these lesions, they're immovable because it's infiltrating into the muscle. So they're indurated. They almost have this mass effect that you can feel that's deep to the actual lesion itself. And, and that was a carcinoma as well. This is a 13-year-old boy. And I'm getting really close to the end, so I do appreciate your patience. Uh, this is a 13-year-old boy no significant medical history, no underlying genetic predisposition that would make him susceptible to develop carcinoma. And the surgeon contacted me and said, you know, he's like, Paris, I think this, you know, it almost looks like it could have been traumatic in a 13 year old kid, but he can't chew this far back on his tongue. So, and he doesn't have any sort of parafunctional habit. And so I'm concerned about this. And so he did a biopsy. And I'm the one who actually looked at the histology and I was shocked. It was severe dysplasia with areas that were suggestive of invasive carcinoma. The patient was referred to a head and neck surgeon. They did a wider excision and found invasive carcinoma in the rest of this. 13 years old, underwent more than a hemi, sorry, hemi glossectomy. So they took off a little more than half of his tongue. He ended up having nodal disease at the time. So he actually had a bilateral neck dissection as well. Okay. And it was a deep penetrating tumor. And that's why they had to take a little bit more than what was initially thought. Um, and so this is a really unfortunate situation. But again, no age is immune. Whenever you're evaluating a patient for any sort of pathologic process, whether we're talking about precancerous or cancerous lesions, make sure you do it objectively. Okay, uh, and this was a, a really good example of that and really great on the clinician's part for picking that up. This is a patient of mine. Um, she has diffuse oral tongue involvement and in the lapse of the shutdown and uh, four or five months where I didn't get a chance to see her, she developed this fungating mass on her left tongue. 
Mind you, she has a prior diagnosis of cancer in this area. She also has a cancer diagnosis on the right lateral tongue before. So she has this whole area that is pre-malignant and, and developed this cancer. I saw her post-operatively after that tongue cancer surgery, and she had this lesion on the anterior dorsal or anterior dorsal lateral aspect. I biopsied this, and this was also invasive carcinoma. So these are patients, some of these patients do develop more extensive disease and do need to be managed and monitored more closely. This is the last case I have for you guys. Um, and this is a case that uh, really resonates with me. This was during the course of my residency and it wasn't a case of mine, but a, a colleague or a co-resident. This was a patient that was sitting in the waiting room and you could tell she was nervous. And my, my colleague went out there as a buddy of mine. He went out there and he said, you know, what have you been referred here for? And our clinic deals with a lot of inflammatory disease. We're not specific for precancerous lesions or cancer. Um, and she said, well, I think I have an inflammatory condition in my mouth, but I'm afraid that it might be something else. And so we brought her back. And in discussing this with her, come to find out that she had been seen or been prescribed. Now, we don't know if she was actually seen or not but had been prescribed um, for months, uh, some antibiotics and a couple of rounds of steroid um, for this inflammatory condition. Um, and clearly you can probably see here, there's fullness and there's this hint of something not being right in this region, this lesional area. It's, uh, it's an eschar that is formed as a result of drying out of that ulcer. And there's the fullness in the lip here. And you look inside her mouth and there's this destructive erosive mass involving the anterior aspect of her maxillary gingiva, the labial mucosa, the buccal mucosa. And you look on her palate and it is extending all the way back posteriorly um, to the molar region. So this is something that uh, this is something that's really important um, and it really does resonate. Um, take the time to sit down with these patients. It really is important to go through their history um, and, and, and be aware of things like this. So treatment for, for oral cancer, uh, surgical resection is the mainstay with or without radiation, with or without chemo and immunotherapy at this point, um, depending on the staging and the type of cancer. The genes are part of our future. Uh, everybody should be aware there are resources out there um, because certain cancers, uh, even certain types of squamous cells can be, um, can have certain molecular changes that can be targeted by medications. Um, and you can get those studies done if you or your patient or family member have tumors like this uh, by requesting it through the pathologist. So this is pretty much the basis of my talk. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to this stuff. I want everybody to know that I Personally, I'm a resource here in the state of Texas. If you have anything, you have any questions, if you need anything, I, I'll make myself available um, anytime. And in closing, this is my dad. And uh, he suffered from oral cancer for about 20 plus years. And when I say suffered, we, we were pretty fortunate. He had a decent, uh, a decent life in regards to his overall prognosis. He was diagnosed with... Uh, a third or fourth recurrence. Um, he himself was a physician. He was diagnosed in it with a third or fourth recurrence in 2018, uh, which required probably the biggest surgery he had to date. Um, and that, um, that disease eventually took his life early last year. And so oral cancer to me is something that not I'm just professionally invested in. There's a personal thing thing about this that really resonates with me. And it's part of understanding that not only is this a, a medical thing, not only is this an oral health care thing, this really has impact and implications on, on, on the patient, their family, and, and society. Uh, and we're responsible for that. We're not responsible, you know, we're not just responsible for taking care of these individuals in a medical manner. We're, we're responsible for educating the community as well. When we talk about health IQ, especially in rural areas, it's us, the clinicians. We're the ones who are responsible for their health IQ. Okay. So thanks everybody for your time. Uh, there's my contact information and I apologize for running over, uh, but uh, I, I will be here for a few minutes if anybody does have any questions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Patel. What a wonderful, uh, very informative presentation. I love the slides.
and all of your explanations uh, was just so great. And we thank you all again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you again, Dr. Patel.